Good morning, everybody, and welcome. My name is uh, Titus Matemawi, originally from Zimbabwe, and I've been in the U.S. now for 19 years, and all the 19 years in Michigan. So I consider Michigan as home when I am in the U.S. That's for me. Now, a few housekeeping. Uh, I want you to know that in winter I have difficult with my voice, but I know it will tell, tell me through. Generally, any cold is bad for me. In fact, uh, Debbie was saying, why are you wearing your hat in the office? I said, I'm feeling cold. And then she, she, had, to call, she had to call for the warm to be, yeah, it, yeah, it weighs up. And that has been quite helpful. And also, those who might have missed, this is our wrap-up of our uh, spiritual renewal week. I have been blessed. And I am going to be blessed again today, I know, for sure. But if you have missed any presentations and you would like to listen to them, you can go to lomalindarenewal.org. And you will find what you might have missed. I want to welcome those who are here and those who are watching via live stream and those who are watching on the television. May the good Lord be with you as you watch and as you enjoy. And now I want to introduce our speaker after which I will pray and the voice you will hear is that of our speaker. Our speaker today is Michael Penect. You know, I was saying to him, is this of German origin or what? Because you see the German names are, they can be quite tricky. He's our chief experience officer here at Loma Linda Morieta. I have experienced Michael to be a down-to-earth person. By the way, I did experience because he was part of my industry. And I've also experienced him to be someone who loves the Lord and who loves his family and passionate about continuing the teaching and the healing ministry of Jesus. That's what I have experienced about him. And I know the Lord has a word for us. Let us pray. Worthy are you, Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will, they existed and were created. We thank you for your presence with us. And we thank you for this week of spiritual renewal and the messages we have heard. And even this morning, we thank you for your presence with us. And now, Lord, that you are with us, open our eyes, O oh Lord, we want to see Jesus. May your name be glorified as we listen to your word, because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Interesting thing in nature, if you study it, it can be a reflection even upon our action. Has anybody ever raised chickens? Anybody have chickens, a few chickens? Uh, my in-laws have chickens, and every summer when my kids go, we go there, and they love little chickens. Grandma always gets little baby chickens, and they spend weeks raising these things, feeding these things. But there's an interesting phenomenon that happens with chickens. You can take 10 different chickens from 10 different places, put them into a pen, scatter some feed around. In a matter of moments, they will have established what? The pecking order. You know what the pecking order is? The pecking order goes like this. These 10 chickens, complete strangers minutes ago, now are together in a pen, a little bit of food there, and instantly they determine who's number one. Through a few skirmishes, a little bit of feathers and ruffling, a little pecking around, all of a sudden, chicken number one is established. And here's the thing about chicken number one. Nobody can peck on chicken number one. Then there's chicken number two. Now, chicken number one can peck on chicken number two. So what does chicken number two do? Looks for chicken number three. Because they can't go back up. I can't peck on number one. So I'm looking at who's number three. And then there's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. You don't want to be chicken number ten. 
This is, this is the worst. You know why? Because number nine's looking for you. Because one through eight has spent the whole time pecking on number nine. And number nine is, where's number 10? That's the one that I can load up on. Finally finds number 10. And 10, 10, is, 10 doesn't even really eat that much. Spends his whole time avoiding all the pecks and running around. In fact, it's a very dangerous way to live this way. Even chickens die because they can't get food because they're constantly being pecked and running and hiding. So some, some chicken farmers have tried to come up with a way to solve this. They, they created products uh, called Peck Be Gone. They tried to create this smell. They thought well, they could spray the chickens. It would sort of disrupt this whole pecking order thing. That didn't work. So they created contact lenses that created blurriness and put those on chickens. And they were trying to solve this whole pecking order thing. But even that didn't work. You don't want to be chicken number 10. But I'm so glad we don't live this way. Right? I'm going to reflect here. And we've been talking about Jesus as the master teacher all week in this week of renewal. And, and here's an experience that happens. Um, this is recorded in Mark, the gospel of Mark chapter 10. And this is the group of disciples. And it says they were now on their way up to Jerusalem. And Jesus was walking just in front of them. And the text says the disciples were filled with awe. So Jesus then takes the 12 disciples aside. And once more, he began to describe everything that's going to happen to him. He says, look, you are my trusted followers, the 12 of you. I want you to understand what's going to happen. He says, we're going to go up to Jerusalem where I, the son of man, will be betrayed by the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him with a whip, and ultimately kill him. But after three days, he will rise again. So put yourself in that position. You're one of the 12. You're following Jesus. You're in awe. And Jesus stops and says, listen, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. And here it is. I'm going to be put to death. I'm going to be tortured. I'm going to be pecked on by everybody else. And I'm ultimately going to die. So you put yourself in that position. What would be your response? Here's the response from James and John. The next verse says, then James and John came over and spoke to him, Jesus, pulled him aside a little bit and said, hey, hey, teacher, they called him. We want you to do us a favor, they said. What is your request, Jesus asked. They replied, when you sit on your glorious throne in heaven someday, we want to know if we can sit in the places of honor next to you, one on your right and one on your left. We want to be chicken number one and chicken number two in your glorious kingdom. Think about this response. Jesus has just described he's going to be dying. And he's going to be called what the Bible says a ransom for all. And all James and John could think about was who? Themselves. Where are we going to sit? Where are we going to be in this pecking order? Yeah, don't worry about you. We know you're going to die. Big deal. We want to know where are we? The focus went back to me. Where am I? I? But I'm glad we don't think that way today. I'm really glad we don't live that way. The text goes on this way. It says, when the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, it says they were indignant. They were mad. They're, oh, they got the places one and two. They themselves were upset because they missed out on the top spots in the pecking order. So this is what Jesus did, the master teacher. He called all of them together and says, listen, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over people. And officials flaunt their authority over those under them. Pecking down. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be the leader among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be the first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. In that moment of teaching, Jesus just reversed the pecking order in life. He says, you want to experience fulfillment? You want to experience meaning in life? You think about how you can put others in front of you in the pecking order. Don't see what you can grab onto, where it is you can be, where it is you can sit. You look to others and you pour into their lives more than you take out. 
How are you a blessing? How are you bringing goodness to others? In that little teaching, Jesus reverses the pecking order. But this is hard. This is not a natural way for us to live. Author Rick Ferguson, I think, says it's best in his book called The Leadership Principle. He says this, living your life as a servant of Jesus Christ will likely come at great expense. The moment you make the decision and veer from the path of promotion and prosperity, you will begin paying the price. You will see peers who don't work as hard as you get promotions that you deserve. You will see co-workers get breaks and perks you do not receive. You will see people you know elevated into the limelight for the world to applaud while you stay behind in shadows, performing the custodial duties that must be done but nobody recognizes. You may die in obscurity having spent so much of your time behind the scenes that everybody has learned to take your service for granted. When your time on earth is done, the world may reflect upon your greatness and contributions and lament, ah, oh, what a waste of greatness. Kind of inspiring, isn't it? But Jesus says, if you want the path to peace, if you want the path to fulfillment, that's where it's found, putting others in front of you, looking to see where can I serve, where can I pour goodness into somebody else's life today. So Jesus there described the reverse pecking order. A little bit later, the weekend comes where Jesus is ultimately going to give his life for all of us. And right before then, again, he calls the 12 disciples together, and we call this the Last Supper. He gathers in a room. They're going to share a meal together. Jesus comes into the room, and the first thing he does, he picks up the basin and the towel. This is the job of the servant, to wash the feet. And Jesus comes And he says to the group, he says, I am right now in this moment going to show you the full extent of God's glory. This is it. The final thing he wants the disciples to know. Everything has built up to this moment. This is the full extent of God's glory. I'm going to wash your feet. That's the image. And he begins down washing Peter's feet, who at first tries to say, no, I can't. And Jesus says, no, Peter, unless I wash your feet, you're not going to understand the full extent of God's love and his glory. So one by one around the room, he begins washing each one of their feet. And I can hear the room in silence as they're shocked at what Jesus is doing. This is the king of kings, the prince of princes, washing my feet. And then Jesus says this, if I have done this to you, you turn and do this to others. You never know what can happen when you pour into someone's life more than you take out of this world. You don't understand the difference that you can make. It can be a small act. It can be something you're not even aware of how that will affect the person. I experienced this firsthand in the healthcare setting. Back in May, my brother, uh, Roger, was diagnosed with uh, an infection in his disc at C4 in his neck. Required emergency surgery. They took him in, performed the surgery. He came out of surgery, a quadriplegic unable to walk, move his arms, ICU on a ventilator. And here's the sad part. Two weeks later, his first daughter was getting married. She'd been planning the wedding, planning the day, and all the festivities, everything's arranged. I'm flying back to officiate the wedding, and I get there, and my brother's in ICU in the hospital. The wedding goes on. We use the technology like we're using today, broadcasting. We actually broadcast the wedding there into the into the ICU room where my brother was, and he was able to watch it. And then we decided after the wedding and after the reception, we were going to go to the hospital, which is about an hour and a half away, and recreate the ceremony there for my brother so he can see his daughter, give her away in marriage, and redo the vows. So we got in the car, and I was there with my, it was my niece and, and her new husband, Rodney, and we drove to the hospital with Kelsey's mom and my brother's wife and And we get there, and here was the amazing thing. The nursing staff in the ICU had decorated the hallway with streamers and flowers. As we walked down, you walked into the room. It was decorated all around in the room with all these things hanging from the ceiling. I mean, it looked like you'd walked into a wedding. They had a big sheet cake made there with Rodney and Kelsey. And we, I mean, we started to cry just because we saw this. If you've worked in ICU, which many of you have, you know it's busy and it's intense. Where do they get the time to do this? People came in, not on their shift, outside of the time they were getting paid. 
to do this for our family. So we walk in there, and I tell you, it was a beautiful moment there. We redid the vows, and afterwards we, we did that, and we, they cut the cake, and they did the cake with each other, you know, where they mash in each other's faces, and did that. My brother's just laughing and wasn't able to eat, but what they did, they took a little bit of frosting, and they just put it on his lips so he could just taste that little bit of wedding cake. In that moment, they transformed lives. Simply because they weren't thinking about themselves, the work that they had to do in their life. They thought for a moment, here's someone else in need. And we can pour into their lives. We can pour some goodness in and create some healing for them. I experienced it firsthand. Our whole whole family experienced that firsthand. Jesus says you live this way. Not the pecking order, not where it is. And every day we have to wake up in the morning and resist that urge to figure out where it is. And where are we? You push that aside and you begin looking at other people's and saying that I have been called, the sacred calling all of us here in Loma Linda University Health, we've been called to serve. In small ways, big ways, whatever it is. So today, whether it's at the bedside, whether it's behind a computer terminal typing away, Whatever it is your work is, it's a sacred calling. And look around at those around you and say, how can I be a blessing to them? How can I, in turn, serve them? Because when I do that, then I understand the full extent of God's glory. I experience the full extent of his love in that moment. Let's pray. Jesus, you are the master teacher. And every single day, we remember this lesson that you taught us. That putting others first is the full extent of your love. It's how we experience your love. It's how we pass love on to those around us. So today, in whatever way that we can, may we look into another person's eyes and simply figure out, how can I love this person? How can I pour goodness into their life? Because we never know the effect that it may have. Thank you so much for your son, Jesus, and for his love. It is in his name that we pray.